Hello, welcome back. I'm back. Hopefully this is a better reception. Um, once again, I have a book launch that I'm hosting on the 5th of September in the UK and it's in North London. Um, the details are on the website um, www.findminstreuk.com and also I posted up posters on Facebook with respect to the book launch as well as Twitter and Instagram on the Ministry's Instagram page. So do read that information and you can purchase tickets. They're £25. They're not very expensive, but you get a, hell, a heck of a lot for your money. Okay, I'm going to tell you that now. I've got so much planned for you, as well as a signed copy of the book, Designed with the Glory. There's also a surprise gift for those of you um, who um, attend, and as well as some light refreshments, hopefully. I will be doing a, a presentation. I'll be meeting and greeting you, shaking your hand, um, and doing some Q&A. Um, if you just want to meet me and hear a bit more about me and what I'm about and what the ministry is about, um, feel free to come along. Please invite friends and family, they're all welcome, but they will be charged obviously per person £25 um, per ticket, per person, um, simply because of um, what's actually involved and what you actually get for each person. So. Um, do spread the word. Now for tonight's Bible study. Um, we ended last the last session, I believe it was session 21, um, if I'm correct, with looking at keywords. Um, and I think the keyword we're looking at was darkness um, and light. And um, we would will be continuing with looking at that, but for the benefit of those people who are new and who are just seeing um, the ministry for the first time, I'm going to go through some basics um, because I think it's essential that everybody gets a gist of what's actually happening. Before we start anything tonight, um, we're going to pray. Okay, we always pray. That's always a good thing to do. Uh, so do join me in prayer right now. Father, we come to you not on our own accord, but in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is holy beyond comprehension. Father, we thank you for all that he has done, all that he is doing, and all that he is to do. Father, we come now to gain an understanding and a revelation as to how to study and meditate upon your word. Give me the right words to share with your people tonight concerning how we are to proceed in studying and understanding and comprehending your word. Let everybody that um, is present on this broadcast have a hunger and a desire to study and to meditate upon your word. Let their mind be at total peace and rest when they study and have, let them have peace and quiet wherever they are so they can understand each word line by line. May they develop the patience, the wisdom, the discernment and the understanding of your scriptures in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Now, for the benefit um, as I said, for those who don't know the format, I have actually got a video out, um, which is called um, uh, the Vine Minister UK Workshop Video 5, which is available on the website, should be available on the website. So if you go through, scroll, scroll through all the videos, past videos on live Bible study, you'll come to Video 5, which is Workshop Video, which is a key one. But this is sort of like a summary of everything that's done in there, but then that actually takes you through um, the whole process of using the tools and um, coming to a conclusion about scripture and looking at the passage. Okay, tools. When you study the Bible, you need tools, like any workman, don't you? You need um, things that you study the Bible with. For instance, we know that the Bible occurs in many different translations. Why, you'd say? Why, why are they in many different translations? Because 
sometimes it, somebody when they translate something they translate it in a format that um is 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 basically restricted to what resources they have okay and they interpret it a certain way okay i think it's all it's all the same words but some words have more than one meaning um and therefore you don't get the full benefit of the meaning until you compare other translations because um some translations give you more of an insight than others and others just plainly say what's there in in the scripture okay so we compare different translations now there is a variety of translations but the ones i tend to use which i think aid me in understanding the bible is this one the english standard version okay that's the first translation the second one is the niv okay which is the new international version okay the third one is the amplified bible okay that's really informative okay and i'll go into the difference between each one and then fourthly the king james bible okay it's nice to have brand new books which are manky so try and keep your books in a nice neat tidy format respect your books okay as much as you can obviously if you read a lot your book tends to get worn and tatty and that's a key time to replace them um, but um, sometimes you underline things in the bible and that's very useful and if you keep keep your copy but do try to keep it in a readable form where you, you've maintained it in a good standard the amplified bible tends to explain scripture on the line and give you more details as to the meaning of those the verses that you just read for instance i'll give you an example at the moment we're studying genesis chapter one and john chapter one let me read you the first bit it says in the beginning god prepared formed fashioned and created the heavens and the earth and then it has a quote hebrews 11 3. okay now in the other books say for instance the esb this is what it says in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth you know what I mean? see the difference it just states something it doesn't go into an elaborate explanation whereas it says here prepared formed fashioned and created so it goes into a lot more detail um, to give you in the gist of what was meant to define um, what's happening which is good it's good and it helps when you're studying um, sometimes things are not very clear when somebody just states something you think well, what does that really mean you know and it's good for when you want to answer questions okay so that's the first thing and the king james version okay it's written in what i call old english so perhaps not that verse is not really a good example of what i mean but it says in the beginning god created the heaven and the earth um but another format is like when it says for instance So I'm trying to find a verse which actually speaks in Old English. But it says phrases like um, Let's see. 
it's interesting to find this sort of, sort of found an example before coming on. But um, it does go into Old English. Here we go. Um, let's see. Oh, verse 18 of chapter 2. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him an helpmeet for him. A helpmeet. Okay, um, whereas in obviously New English it would just be a help for him. Um, so it tends to go in a little bit more of an old English, or it will include words that are most probably not modern day English, but old English, but mean most probably exactly the same thing. And the international version is, is just something that's used universal, it's understood in, in pretty much most countries that um, understand English. Um, so it's something that's um, not just um, British English, but say American English and you know other English speaking countries that understand English. It's something that's um, used nationally. OK, so that's the first point. When we study the Bible, it's good to have a dictionary because some words we don't really know the meaning of the words. So you can have an autumn dictionary, you know, a really good dictionary in Oxford or um, you know, in a thesaurus, you get, or you can get a Cambridge dictionary, you know, any one of those, that's an ordinary dictionary. And there are special dictionaries, which are called Bible dictionaries. And Bible dictionaries, like I've got this one here, the Oxford Bible dictionary, um, tend to, when they define words, uh, they talk and give reference to scripture passages as well to give you more gist of when the word is used and to give you a bit more understanding of the meaning. For instance, anoint. It says here, in the OT, Old Testament, persons and things were consecrated by anointing with oil. Kings were enthroned by anointing. Solomon 1, Kings 1, 39, priests were anointed for the office here on Exodus 29, 7. Uh, David refers to Saul as Lord's anointed, 1 Samuel 24, 6, and Cyrus, king of Persia, is God's anointed, Isaiah 41. In Hebrew, this is Messiah, and in Greek, Christos. Jesus is said to be anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power, Acts 10, 38. Anointing was also used medicinally, Luke 10, 34, and as gestures of affection toward both the living. Luke 7, 38, and the dead, Mark 16, 1. Okay, that's an example of a Bible dictionary. It goes into a lot more detail. The other tool um, which you would use, um, which I would um, use, okay, is a concordance. Now, some Bibles, uh, like the ESV I've got here, Study Bible, study Bibles have their own concordance which is good that's good we can only pack so much into a Bible so if you actually get a specific concordance like for instance the Strong's one which is what I've got here it has a lot more in it okay now what's a concordance for a start you get instructions at the beginning which tells you how to use the concordance and this one's called the expanded exhaustive concordance of the Bible okay This is for serious Bible studies, but not just serious ones, but for Christians all over. Okay, we want to have a bit more understanding of the Bible. It lists in alphabetical order every name, and then underneath it gives you the list of passages and verses where that name occurs or where that topic occurs. It could be a name or a topic. You could think, oh, I want to know who is Abijah. Oh, right, Abijah, where does he appear? Abijah, here we go, Abijah in A. Oh, he appears in, oh, 1 Kings 14, 1, 1 Chronicles 24, 10, 2 Chronicles, which is very useful. And you can just go into the Bible passage and read about it. So it's like almost like a map when you want to know about somebody and you've read the Bible, so you've read the whole Bible, but you just can't remember where certain things are. It's like a map, a quick reference map. 
we can literally go and quickly look at, look it up. If you want to know all about the word or person, so this is a very useful tool to have. Okay. It also not just does names, but topics. It says eat, easy. It goes to earthen. Okay, fear, fathers, topics. Um, um, God, everything about God. Now, the, the bit about God is extensive, of course, because he's mentioned throughout the Bible. Okay, so you've got several pages here on God and where he's mentioned, uh, what he says, what he does, um, and it goes on and on and on. It is one of the most interesting books to go through, and the most useful one of the most useful ones I, I find. When you want to find things, um, Malachi, you've got Makalas, Maki, Making, Marshall, Machirite, okay, and it's just a good reference point. Um, the final um, tool you might find useful is what we call a Bible commentary, okay. This is a Bible commentary over the Oxford one, it's quite a huge one. Um, in a Bible commentary now, it literally lists every book of the Bible and explains every verse, or it goes into detail a little bit about every verse commentary. So it, it explains it, it translates it. In other words, it gives you a bit more than the verse that you're reading. It tells you a bit more history about that verse and why certain things were said in that verse. So whereas you'd read it and not know much, it would go into a little bit more de detail and it introduces each book of the Bible. It, it introduces each book of the Bible, it introduces the Old Testament, the New Testament, and um, it gives you further references as well for reading. Let me give you an example. So it first of all gives an introduction to Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible. Okay. It talks about theology of the books. So it goes into a bit more deeper depth of the books. Okay. Here it has Genesis. The first chapter, the first bit. Okay. Genesis and the Pentateuch says, then it goes literary geno, decomposition, the date of Genesis. Then it talks about themes, then it commentary, the history of, of origins. Okay. And then it starts with verse 1, 1 to 2, the creation of the world. Then it does verse 2, 3. Um, it goes on and then it does 4, 1 to 16, it does chapters 1 to 16, it does the whole of the book of Genesis and it discusses right through what each bit is, the story of Jacob, the adventures of Jacob, it goes into a bit more detail. I'll give you an example, the story of Jacob. Of the three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, only Isaac lacks a really independent story. Although as Abraham's here and Jacob's father, he obviously holds an essential place in the family history and is in his turn the recipient of the promise of blessing and of numerous descendants for Abraham's sake. Now this is a bit of a cheat. In other words, we don't want you to really read this because it, it kind of stops you from using your mind and um, accessing the help of the Holy Spirit to guide you into understanding what the Bible's about. This explains what the, the verses mean, but what we're trying to obtain is your ability to observe a passage and to decipher for yourself and with the help of the Holy Spirit what is meant and what is actually being indicated in the passage. This is just extra information as like confirmation to make sure that you're not going off course as to what it is that you're being um, shown or what you're learning. So uh, don't ever really resort to this. 
um, until after you've done all your investigations and all your study yourself. This is the lazy man's guide, okay? And that's not what I want you to do. I don't want you to fall back on it, okay? So just put that aside. But it's just there anyway. And it's something you, you read after you've done your exercises and you've really exercised, challenged yourself to learn and to comprehend what you're actually reading in the Bible. Now, okay. There's a book that I recommend you get. It's not very expensive. It's only about three or four pounds, not even that really in British money, which is about, what, two dollars or something like that. I don't even think it's that. Um, but it's a very valuable book, and I read it, and it's a guide to how we, we implement these tools and how we are to read the Bible. And it's not just a book about studying the Bible is a book that you can use to study anything really um, using this format and the book is written by Elita Wald and it's called The Joy of Discovery of Bible. I'm just going to quickly show you this now um, here. I'm going to show you the book side. That's the black and white. Um, it, that's just in black and white but it's a red and white book um, and could you see it says The New Joy of Discovery in Bible study, Alita Wald. Okay, can you see that? I hope you can see that. I hope you can see that. Can you see that? Right, okay. Right. Okay, I hope you saw that. Okay. That's the book I'm going to recommend, and it will help you to go into, by going into detail as to how you are to implement these tools by giving you exercises you can practice on, um, outside of the study the session that we're doing here to sharpen your observation skills and your interpretation skills and how you apply it to your own life okay so that's just the basic book that gives you a guideline okay um, I try to use it as a help okay I find it very invaluable so once again it's the new joy of discovery in Bible study and it's a new revised Book by Alita Wald. Okay, I found that very informative. Okay, now from that book, I was able able to formulate the format of what we're how we're going to study. Genesis chapter 1 and John chapter 1 and we've been following this format okay um, in order to observe the various passages um, that are there so in session 1 I basically formulated an outline which was the basic one first of all we're going to observe and there's some steps in observing the passages that we're observing. And then we're going to interpret what we've observed. And then we're going to summarize our findings. And then we're going to evaluate our findings. And then we're going to apply our findings. Okay. And then actualize it. Okay. And I'm just going to go through the steps that are involved in each part, just for the benefit of those who are unaware. And remember, this is all taken from the book that I just basically highlighted to you. Okay, and um, this is the format we're using. Um, so first of all, you read through the passage, then you take a note of key words. Okay. And keywords and the indication for keywords are usually ones that are repeated or ones that you feel important or jumping out at you that's important for that particular passage. Um, then we search for advice, verses which give advice, admonitions, warnings, and promises. Okay. Then we look for reasons and results. 
then we look for contrasts, comparisons and illustrations in the format of something is like or something is something when you're comparing what's like. Um, uh, repetition and progression of ideas. So in other words, you're looking at the passage as a whole and looking for an idea that's in there and see if the writer repeats it and if the progression like building up to something they're trying to point out. Questions. Sometimes there's questions asked in the passage and you need to know why that person's asking that question. Um, like for instance, those of you who've been doing my 40 days fun question I had was why did Saul ask who son David was if he already knew in chapter 16 of First Samuel who Saul's father was, Jess. I'm oh, sorry, David's father was Jess. And there was obviously a more hidden meaning behind it. He's trying to find out his status. You know, who are they? What are they? Who are from? Because he was amazed at what David could do. You see what I mean? So things like that. Um, important connectives. Prepositions, conjunctions. Okay. The word and is kind of a connective. Or, um, but, um, it's not a good example. Um, if then, some, uh, if then, you know, um, and a few other, a few other words that connect um, sentences, important key ones. Um, I'll give you some examples. Um, that are a little bit more um, prominent. If then, as a conditional, okay. Um, that's part of a warning, really, isn't it? Um, or a promise. Um, and is, is definitely one. And prepositions. I don't know, offhand, I cannot think of any, but as they come up, I'll, I'll give you an example, okay. Bear with me. Grammatical construction, verbs, nouns, pronouns, adverbs, adjectives. Um, in particular, we're looking at the tenses in which it's used, be it future, past, or present tense. Atmosphere, emphatic statements. Okay, usually um, the word behold or an exclamation mark is an indication of an emphatic statement. A shout. Okay. Literary form, when we talk about literary form, we're talking about, is it a narrative? Is it written a poetic? Is it apocalyptic? Um, how is it written? You know, because um, then that gives you a clue as to what the book's about, what we're about, and, and how we are to view it. And then general structure. And by general structure, what we do is we go through the verses, we group them into similar verses, um, and describe what those verses are actually pertaining, and thus get an overview of the, 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 the actual chapter and what the um, book is about, so we can see it as a, as a whole. Because sometimes you look at something in, in fine detail, you can't really see the message or what's happening. So we sort of stand back and we group them to sort of see what the progression or the general thing is, the structure, how the right author's written it, and why they've written it in that, that order. Then, interpret. 
Okay, and in the interpretation stage, which is what we're out on actually at the moment, um, and we're quite, quite far down on the interpreting stage, um, but I'm just giving you an example um, in using Genesis chapter 1 and John chapter 1 as an example of how we'd observe the passage. But remember, the chapters we're observing are just chapters of a whole book. So you need to observe the whole book as a whole. But bear in mind that the Bible really was just written as one stream originally without any chapters and verses. And the reason chapters and verses were put in so you can easily reference this. So when we study it, we're studying it like um, so we're observing a chapter, which is just a snapshot, really. Um, it's just looking into detail into that chapter. But then we're going to progress and do that with each of the chapters and then put it together as a book of a, as a whole to see if our assumptions and what we found in the first chapter marries up with what we assumed by the time we get to the end of the book. Okay. So interpret. To interpret, we ask questions for understanding. Okay, um, and the questions we ask for, about each verse that we're reading is meaning. What's the meaning of this verse? What does it mean? Why did this, you know, mean why, what, what they mean by this? Significance. How significant is this verse to the whole passage? Does it rank as important? or not so important. Do some verses rank higher than others? Implication. Is there an implication by something that's said here? Is there a hidden meaning when somebody says something in a verse? Is it implying something? What can you infer from it? Like for instance, some of the some of the chapters uh, open up with oh King Solomon of so and so, brother of so and so, line of whatever. What can you infer from that? Why do they open it up like that? Because you're inferring that he's the king, he's the son of that, he's the son of this, his lineage. This is what they are. This is who they are. That's his 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 status. That's who he is. That's his authority. That's who. That's what gives him the right to state what he's about to state. Okay. So you get an introduction to the person, the introduction to their background, the introduction is to their authority to be able to state or say what they're about to say. Okay. Um, relationship. Okay, so that's an example of a relationship. But you can also get an example of a relationship by comparing passages and see if that relates to something else. I mean, what I found was sometimes you read a passage and then a little bit further down in another chapter it's almost as if you're reading the same thing again and what it is is they're just elaborating on what they've stated before and there is a relationship between the two it's exactly the same thing it's just it's showing it to you in another format to give you a bit more revelation about something that they've already mentioned so it's not exactly that there is a repetition of something that's happened before. It's, it's, it's the same thing, it's the same story, it's the same person, or it's the same situation, but you get a bit more of an insight. You already had the introduction to that situation, and you get more of a revelation, and you see what I mean as you read the Bible. Um, progression. Um, basically, styles of writing, um, styles of the verses, does it build up to something? Is there something they're leading up to to show you something? It starts with something, then how does it finish? Okay. Literal or figurative? Okay. Sometimes somebody says something, like for instance, a classic example of the parables of Jesus. He speaks in parables to people who aren't close to him. So that would just be figurative speaking. Um, but there is a literal meaning behind the parable. 
Um, so whereas it will speak plain to his disciples and people that are close to him. Okay, so therefore that's a literal example. Use of cross-reference and cross-references are what you see basically in the margins of chapters. For instance, in the, in the ESV, can you see Right there, let me show you. Those are cross references, okay, and they're relating to each verse, okay. So it's other parts in the Bible, or other verses in the Bible that are relevant to the actual verse that you're reading, so you can get a more better understanding of what you're reading. You will note I'm just reading um, for those of you who are not aware, I'm actually doing another live periscope by broadcast a bit later on tonight with respect to um, meditation on Okay, I hope it's not going to be too badly, but yes, later on I'm doing another periscope broadcast with respect to today's um, uh, fast update. And you'll notice I'm just reading the passage. I'm not looking at cross references. I'm just reading it as I'm reading it. But the correct way to actually study the Bible is to look at cross reference, like I'm showing you here. So that's the interpretation. Compare translations. I already explained to you, went through you about different translations of the different versions of Bibles. You got NIV, you got the Amplified, you got the King James Version, as well as the ESV. So you're comparing different translations. Forward meanings. Now you've registered the key words, now it's telling you to find the words and forward the meanings. And it's then telling you to pray and meditate because the Bible is a spiritual book, it is a prophetic book, and therefore you pray and you meditate to get revelation from the Holy Spirit with respect to the meaning of the book. Because it's written by God, really, essentially, it's God's book, it's God's story. So when he really understands the true meaning of what he what was written in there. So we pray from and meditate to discern, define, compare, investigate, consult, and wrestle and summarize. Okay, so it's long involved. Okay, uh, then recording interpretations. We record what we inter interpret, so we don't make it and we make notes. So it's good to have a notebook as well or a computer where you can note things that you find out um, through revelations. It's one of the most rewarding things, that's all I can say, when you have a revelation about something you've learned in school. It makes you feel super intelligent, um, although it's nothing to do with you, it's to do with the Holy Spirit, everything. So you find that revelation and you get that breakthrough. Then it says list of definitions of keywords. Okay, so we've already listed the keywords and then we've defined the words, so we're just listing the definitions of the keywords. Okay, then we record phrases from other translations that give you insight. So when you look at the different translations, you're going to make a note of ones that are kind of key that you feel give you new insight to the meaning of something that you didn't really understand before. So you're going to record those because they're going to be important into the final analysis and summarising. Then you list some of the cross references found relating to the key ideas. Okay, so you would have listed the key ideas when you did the general structure and significance of the verses. Okay, and the the, the actual key words. And then record any significant information gained from a Bible dictionary or commentary. And I already spoke to you and showed you a Bible dictionary, okay, which is this, and the commentary there. Do you notice they put the Bible commentary last because by this time you should have formulated something in your mind and come to your own conclusion about something. So the commentary is only there at the end to double check that you haven't gone off course. Okay, and then finally you summarize 
what has been learned. So you've got all your information together and you summarise what you've learned. And then you evaluate, you evaluate what you've learned. And by evaluation, we say, okay, how important is it to your situation? How important is it to the Bible? What was the important message here? What's the key thing that you've learned? And then apply, okay? The application process involves uh, several steps. You interpret in terms of your own experiences. So your own experiences are key to this. Obviously, if you're a child and you haven't done much in life, then you're going to find this bit a bit, bit difficult. OK, but hopefully, OK, or, or, or rather, Jesus didn't find this bit difficult even at the age of 12, because obviously he's Lord of all. But an ordinary child might find this bit a bit difficult. But you're adults and um, you're maturing people. So, you know, um, if you don't have any experiences whatsoever, do do discuss something with discuss your finding with someone else that might help you to revelate, hence why we come together um, to share each other's experiences, because that's the beauty of coming together and doing Bible study um, and um, gaining feedback from each other. Okay, so um, then you have to complete the statements, okay, learning how to study the Bible will help me understand, blah, 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 and you do it for your own self. What I receive in this Bible study will depend on, blah, blah, blah. Again, something you do yourself. Hindrances that prevent the word of God growing in my life are, blah, blah, blah. You complete that sentence. God's action in my life is, blah, 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 blah. And you complete that sentence. The good news I find in this passage for me is, again, you complete that sentence. Then you pray about your individual response to the word. OK, in other words, you're praying about it, what you found, what you feel it means to you, how you want that word to grow root in your life, what you feel moved by the Holy Spirit to pray for. Then you actualize it. You implement what you've learned in your life. You literally use it. Action's important. Until you use it, it just becomes knowledge. So you've got to action it in your life. You've got to make it bear fruit in your life to prove that all your studying has not been in vain. And that's one of the most key points when you get to understanding the Bible. Now, we're drawing almost near to the end of this session, but the point or the place we're up to in interpreting is where list the definitions of keywords okay, that's what we're doing and we're interpreting that we're looking at that in detail okay and um that's the bit we're up to okay and um, we're looking at the keywords i think there was about five keywords we had um but um the keywords i have them here Do have them here. Beginning, created, darkness, spirit of God, light, man, and life. There weren't five, there was um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven keywords I picked up from the passage. You could have done more, but these are the ones I picked up. Um, so it's different for every person. You might pick up something more than I than what I did, and that's good. That's why we come together to hear and share each other's opinions. Um, Once again, we are focusing on um, chapter one of Genesis and chapter one of John, and we're comparing the two passages. And um, as I said, that's the format we're following. And if you want a copy of that, you can go to the website and there, these notes are actually up on the website for you. So. You don't need to need, really take notes as you're listening. Um, these notes are already up there. OK. Um, so.
So observing the whole book of Genesis, this is what we did first. We observed the book as a whole and summarized the book as a whole. The reason why we did that is so we see the whole picture before we go in and analyze the first chapter. Okay. And what we did was we listed basically what each chapter was about. Chapter one was about the creation of the world. Chapter two, the seventh day rest, creation of man and woman. Chapter three, the fall, temptation, sin introduced, curse incurred. Chapter four, Cain and Abel. Chapter five, Adam's descendants to Noah. Uh, chapter six, increasing corruption on earth, God favours Noah. Chapter 7, God instructs Noah about the ark. Chapter 8, the flood subsides. Chapter 9, God blesses Noah and his descendants. Chapter 10, nations descend from Noah. Chapter 11, Tower of Babel, dispersed of earth, Shem's descendants, Terah's descendants. Chapter 12, call of Abraham, Abraham, Syria and Egypt. Chapter 13, Abraham and Lot separate. Chapter 14, Abraham rescues Lot. Chapter 15, God's covenant with Abraham. Chapter 16, Sarah and Agar. Chapter 17, Abraham and the covenant of circumcision. Isaac's birth promised. Abraham intercedes for Sodom. Chapter 18, Lord appears to Abraham at Manna. Chapter 19, God rescues Lot. God destroys Sodom, Lot and his daughters. Chapter 20, Abraham and Abimelech. Chapter 21, the birth of Isaac, God protects Agar and Ishmael, treaty with Abimelech. Chapter 22, sacrifice of Isaac. Chapter 23, Sarah's death and burial. Chapter 24, Isaac and Rebekah. Chapter 25, Abraham's death and his descendants, birth of Esau and Jacob. Esau sells his birthright. Chapter 26, God's promise to Isaac, Isaac and Abimelech. Chapter 27, Isaac blesses Jacob. Chapter 28, Jacob sent to Laban, Esau marries an, an, an Ishmaelite, Jacob's dream. Chapter 29, Jacob marries Leah and Rachel. Chapter 30, Rachel demands a child, Jacob's prosperity. Chapter 31, Jacob flees from Laban. Chapter 32, Jacob fears Esau, Jacob wrestles with God. Chapter 33, Jacob meets Esau. Chapter 34, the defiling of Dina. Chapter 35, God blesses and renames Jacob death of Rachel and Isaac. Chapter 36, Esau's descendants. Chapter 37, Joseph's dreams, Joseph sold by his brothers. Chapter 38, Judah and Tamar. Chapter 39, Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Chapter 40, Joseph interprets two prisoners' dreams. Chapter 41, Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dream, Joseph rises to power. Chapter 42, Joseph's brothers go to Egypt. Chapter 43, Joseph's brothers return to Egypt. Chapter 44, Joseph tests his brothers. Chapter 45, Joseph provides his brothers and family, provides for his brothers and family. Chapter 46, Joseph brings his family to Egypt. Chapter 47, Jacob's family settles in Goshen, Joseph and the famine. Chapter 48, Jacob blesses Ephraim and Manasseh. Chapter 39, 49, Jacob blesses his sons, Jacob's death and burial. Chapter 50, God's Good purpose, death of Joseph. And that's it. Then we summarise and outline the book of Genesis. Okay. Chapters 1 and 2, God's creation. Chapters 3, 6, 11, 19, 34, introduction to corruption and sin. Chapters 1, 9, 27, 35, God blesses his people. Chapters 4 and 5, Adam's descendant to Noah. Chapters 6 to 10, story of Noah. Chapters 12 to 25, story of Abraham and descendants. Chapters 26, 27, God's relationship with Isaac. Uh, chapters 38, 35, all about God's relationship with Jacob. Chapter 36, Esau. 37 to 46, Joseph. 47 to 49, Jacob and his family restored back to the world. Jacob dies. Chapter 50, Joseph dies. That's how we summarise the outline of the book of Genesis. Okay. We then went and did the same thing for John, book of John, so another book of John, um, pretty much like that. Um, as I said, these notes are up on the website, so you can go and review them at any point in time you would like to do so. But it's just for your benefit. I've just gone through that very quickly here tonight. 
I hope you enjoy this Bible study. We're coming to a close now. Um, but do encourage people to come on this Bible study. It's so important. And it's the basics. It's a, it's a simple Bible study for people who may have challenges studying the Bible. Um, and it's literally a noddy fashion. It's the Dilbert. It's for the dummies, basically. Well, not for the dummies, but people who just want to know a structure format of how to study the Bible, but you know, just haven't got the time to work out what to do and I can tell you it's very enjoyable and it's so vital especially for a growing Christian and someone who's been baptized who just don't know where to begin to study the Bible so do encourage your friends to come on board I'm here I'm here permanently I want to stay here and I want to help you um, and it helps me too and I enjoy doing it and I enjoy sharing with you and I love you all I just want you to love God the way I love him if not more um, and just enjoy his word because it's all we've got really for life to breathe life into our spirits and to give us nurturing and i want so much for you to grow and um, it doesn't cost anything at all for this bible study however if you feel like you want to support the ministry and you like what, what the ministry is about do go to the website www.findministryuk.com and show your appreciation um, you can donate as many as much as you like as little as you like it could be a pound it could be anything you feel the Lord has set upon your heart to do but you're under no obligation whatsoever but I do this because I enjoy doing it and I love sharing the word of God and I love reading my Bible for those of you who want to see me and you're not tired of seeing me you can see me tonight once again at 9 30 where I will be sharing um, how my day 14 of my fast or scope 15 of my fast is going etc and we will continue reading the book of second samuel i believe we're on chapter 22 uh, but i could stand corrected and so um, i'll see you a bit later for those of you who want to see me a bit later i just want to bid you a very good evening a blessed evening and hopefully hopefully if i've not bored you too much i'll see you next month on the 24th same time same place i hope to see you bless you goodbye <laughs>